Okay, so I guess to start. Um, so I think I want to start with just some administrative things like um, when to meet. Um, so it's it's tricky because I'm I'm in Berkeley here regularly. I'll be here a lot of November and December. There's also a lot of like I'm in November December with like Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, and things like that. So it's um, it's not that much time. Um, and then. We, and after that, I'm around sporadically. So, um, I was thinking it'd be nice to have two days each week we can meet. And initially, there was a Friday that I, I guess some subset of you filled out a little web form to look for availability. And there were two slots that no one had a conflict with. Um, but one of them was on a Friday. Fridays, you know, like this coming Friday, the, I guess things are closed down. So. Um, so we don't have to settle this now. It might be nice to have a time slot on Monday, but then the, the problem is probably there'll be at least some people who can't make it. Um, so maybe those. Anyway, um, sometime soon we should figure out some way of deciding about that. But it might depend on whether people are interested or not, and you don't know whether you're interested until I try to describe what I was proposing to talk about. Um, so that's, yeah, so what am I proposing to talk about? Um, I guess I had in mind some, you know, I guess you know, often when one's lecturing about you know, latest research results, there's like background material that you, know, you wish you had time to go into, but, um, you know, but you don't because it's only an hour lecture. And, um, and so years of frustration that I figured, okay, now I can you know, talk about these things which to put one, one sense to them when I give a research talk. Um, but I think, I, you know, those of you that I recognize are kind of advanced grad students, so it might be that what I was planning on doing is um, to elementary, I don't know. Um, so, I mean, how many, how many people here, you know, for how many people here are things like, you know, Russia taking, you know, Whitman, Russia taking drive and various and things like that? Relatively new. Okay. Well, okay. <coughs> that answers that question. Okay. So then, my so my goal, again, you know, subject to feedback from the audience, is to um, is is to talk about these things in a fairly leisurely, you know, leisurely way. I, I think it's possible. I think it's actually a pretty elementary subject without. But I, I could be wrong because I, you know, I think about it a lot, and so things seem easy to you once you understand them. And so maybe there's difficulties that I'm just not aware of. But it, I think it's all pretty easy stuff. Um, so the outline of what I was 
thinking of talking about. Um, I'm going to start today with just giving some examples of what I'll call stay models, for lack of a better name, it's something that you know, will eventually mean something more general than what was meant in like, say, the 1980s by that. And, um, and the next point to make, either at the end of the day or next time, is that if we think about a TTFT the way a physicist would, you know, not as a functor from the words and categories, but as actually you know, integrating something, so we're doing a path integral that will, perhaps slightly surprisingly, show, you know, lead us back to the scheme of the idea. Um, and, in, and in fact, this is almost an equivalence. But you know, they, you really haven't lost very much. Thinking of this. So these the rather elementary things we're going to talk about today um, are actually you know, pretty close to sort of real physics. Um, and then this, you know, these ideas will give us our, um, I know maybe our axiomatic. Framework that we're going to work in, and once we set that up, we'll just talk about very about locality, which is all about assembling, you know, something from a big space and you know, cut it into pieces and see how things fit back together. So, um, talk about exotic dimension two plume. Um, and this, you know, special cases of this get things like drip fill, doubles, centers, two different things. Um, and this is what I call the path integral theorem. Which, um, I guess everything we, we do up here in some sense is not, I mean, there's a sense in which it's combinatorial topology, but there's also a sense in which it's not combinatorial in that we, we're not giving our manifold a triangulation and things like that. So we don't, you know, we'll define an invariant for a manifold and just be you know, manifestly an invariant. We don't need to verify invariants under curvy moves or not fair moves or whatever. Um, but when we get to this top dimensional part, um, then we will have to do a little bit of that. So this is um, construction of the path integral, and this leads to various state sums. So, so you said uh, you call this is this your theorem, the path integral? This is a what? You said you call it the path integral theorem. Does that mean it's your theorem? Um. Yeah. It's my theorem. Um. <coughs> And, and then in some sense, um, once we get here, I, I don't know, I mean, so what, you know, you know, probably one of the many ways I'm going to be able to understand the audience is that, you know, a lot of these, these topics are like very hot when I was in grad school. You know, this is, so everybody knows, you know, even if it wasn't your field, you've heard about it because they were like awarding fields and medals to people who didn't And so if you know the history of the subject, you know that it actually starts here. The very first thing people typically do is write down state sums. And we're getting into it at the very end. So this is definitely a historically backward way of treating you know, people starting out with these state sums and then they realize, oh, you know, we, we could push things down to lower dimension and we're going to start at the very lowest dimension and work really it back up. Um, but then from, from this, then we can we derive the sort of special cases of this general theorem, things like Derive of zero state sums and rush to derive type surgery formulas and all, all that things, which I'm assuming some of you have heard of. Um, and then in conjunction with all this, sort of in parallel of talking about this abstract theory, I, I, I do want to make this very a sort of example driven set of talks. Um, so, you know, typically give examples first and then axioms afterwards to try to you know, axiomatize what we're talking about. And so, the, the sort of things which hopefully you will. Talk about in detail, right? Right. Zero theories. And these, in some sense, are just generic. So plus one additional theories. Um, 
Sorry about my bad handwriting. Um, in fact, uh, written theories. Um, these kind of don't have a name. Um, generic, same simple one plus one dimensional theories. So the crane, the other Kaufman type theories, and these will lead us to the type things. Um, and there may be some more exotic things like the new contact structures. Okay, so if um, if none of that makes any sense to you, that's that's fine. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm just trying to for, for I think the sort of significant subset of people here who know something about the subject. Here's parts of it. I'm wondering whether you're going to learn anything new or not. Um, this is what I'm planning to talk about. So figure out. Um, oh, and I, I guess I, I I probably should have said that. What, what we're really taught, this whole thing, you know, the way to, you know, the sort of most top level way of looking at it is we're just constructing some kind of um, machine. And it takes sort of an end category of the right type. And it spits out an end plus one dimensional. T care of T. So this, you know, all of this over here is sort of describing a aspects of this general machinery. And, th and the point is that we can, most of the main theorems you can prove, you know, once for all possible theories and then, you know, specialize in these particular examples. And again, that's sort of historically backwards. Historically, you know, we discovered these things kind of one by one and more ad hoc way. And, and part of the, um, I think part of the, the virtue of this approach, or the reason it's worth going over this again, even though many of these are old results, is that I, I don't think it's sort of appreciated in literature that there is sort of a, a general, you know, either, either, these are all special cases of general construction. Yes. Um, would you be happy to have three as your end category, and three plus one, is that the book of the world? Is that space time? Is that why you say n plus one and then I'm completely coming here. Oh, yeah, so, so you know, why am I saying n plus one instead of, you know, n? Yeah, two plus one is more typical. I'll tell you one plus one is n plus one. Okay, so the reason it's plus, so um, I think we'll, what we'll see soon, but maybe not this lecture, is that um, a TQ of two inside is in various to manifolds of various dimensions. And so in phys in, you know, ideas borrowed from physics. So in physics, you have space, which might be three dimensional. You have space time, which is one higher dimensional. And so in physics, when they talk about the dimension of a theory, there's always that ambiguity. We're talking about space, we're talking about space time. So the physicists came with this convention of talking about you know, d plus one or n plus, you know, so they, they add the plus one, so you know that, okay, if I'm talking about an n plus one dimensional theory, my space so is n dimensional, my space time is n plus one dimensional. Is that? <laughs> But what I'm curious about is why not just stop at three? Is that, isn't that the goal? Um, oh, no. Well, this isn't real. I mean, if we were trying to describe the physics of the real world, then you know, maybe there would be a reason to do that. But um, you know, these, these are ideas borrowed from physics, but then they're put to very different purposes. So we're trying to study manifolds. Of, you know, it's just math. Yeah, it's just math. Yeah. No, no real physics involved. Um, okay. Um, okay, so what I want to do next is just give some examples, again, because we will be forgiving axioms, we'd like to, um, you know, just give the examples which motivate the axioms. Um, and, um, I can't assume you're familiar with the examples already, so I have to describe some. So the, We'll probably spend the entire day talking about the, you know, the Z mod 2 homology of the surface. But we're going to talk about it from a, you know, a different point of view. And this is 
you can also view this as one of these sort of um, you know, what, you know, how mathematics might have developed in some you know, alternative universe or something like that, where people back in the 1930s or 50s you know, went right instead of left at some junction. They would have arrived at these sorts of things you know, much earlier if they had. Um, okay, so let, so I've got some two-dimensional manifold Y. Let's um, first assume that Y is closed. And I'm going to define a functor I'm going to call curly F of Y to be the set of all one sub-manifolds. Are your manifolds compact? Yes. Yeah, I mean, they, they may or may not have boundary, but they're almost always compact. Even in situations where, for some people, it might be more natural to consider like open walls or things like that, otherwise, they're considered closed. Just, just I, but I, on the other hand, I haven't, you know, just sort of instinctively, I, it just seems to me that making everything compact is the right way to do the subject, but I've never really seriously considered what would go wrong if we could try to do open manifolds. Maybe it works out, maybe it's better than most. So you're not trying to call in your plus one, so you're Yeah, no, I would use, I would use B, you know, the ball, the end, so on. Um, okay, so this is some big, I'm just going to think, I don't want to think this is a space or anything, it's just a set. Um, and I want to define an equivalence relation, so I'm going to define a vector space A of Y. This will be my, an example of a scheme module. That's going to be F of Y, the sort of one-dimensional sub-manifold module and equivalence relation. And what is that equivalence relation? Um, well, rapidly, I'll we'll say that a if we change things by an isotopy inside some disk, those are equivalent. So I'll say, so to go to the top here. And so, so what, what these squiggles mean is that you know, I, can, I can change, you know, if I change things by a homeomorphism, I can change the identity, then I consider these two things equivalent. And then inside some larger manifold, you know, everything outside is so. I mean, this, this is a, oh, <laughs> okay, it's a job. Okay, so now I'm going to draw the thing outside of my this point and the one so that goes with. Um, okay, that's, that's not so exciting. Um, the other thing we need to do is if we have a trivial loop inside, um, then that's equal to some multiple of delta of the empty picture. So picture has nothing in this. And I'm gonna I'm doing it this way because of, you know eventually we're gonna let delta be something interesting, but for the moment we're gonna have delta There's an erase trivial loops. And if we have a pair of arcs near each other like this, let's say that's equivalent to the reconnecting of the other. Okay. Then let's check in the first picture, the boundaries are the same for the arcs? Yeah, in all pictures, the, bound, the boundaries are the same. If, if, I, if it doesn't look that way, it's just because of my sloppy drawing. But, and, that, and that's uh, throughout this, things are always, you know, things never, you know, this, in the subject, you know, things never move on the boundary. Um, and I'll probably forget to say that at various times. But when I say things are isotopic, I mean boundary. Now, now, actually, I said here, Y doesn't have a boundary. So when I draw a picture like this, it's just meant to pick. I, I'm sort of zooming in on some particular part of my closed surface Y, and outside of this picture, everything remains the same. So it's not too hard to see that equivalence classes, you know, if you just consider the curves themselves, oh, I am. Um, Actually, I want to change this. I want this to be a vector space. So I'm going to take um, formal, say, complex linear combinations of these curves. Um, 
But if I just consider the curves themselves under this equivalence relation, it's pretty easy to see that two curves are equivalent if and only if they're representing the same homology class. And um, I'm just write it out. So if I take F itself in the opposite of any combinations, my equivalence, you know, this is naturally isomorphic to um, as a set H1 of Y with Z my two coefficients. So Skeptical of that, or um, yeah, sort of elementary algebraic and geometric topology. So, so, so you're not worrying about density or anything like that. Just it's either there or not there. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then, I mean, you know, I think the best way, if you ask me which version of the topology is that right singular. So it's not, it's not quite similar to no, no, it just, I mean, I, I think if you wanted to match this up with a particular way of doing homology of service, then I would recommend the same thing. Um, okay, and so, and so that means that A of Y, the thing with the um, many combinations, is naturally isomorphic to C linear combinations of H and Y and my two coefficients. Or again, we're thinking of this as a set, not as a vector space over Z minus two. Um, but so what I want to do is suppose, you know, a long time ago, when it, you know, people could, you know, these ideas, this could have been done, I don't know how long ago, but certainly in the early part of the 20th century. And one way the subject developed was, you know, homology theory and all that. You know, one tries to make this work for any topological space Y instead of just, say, a surface. Goes on. But suppose we are only interested in surfaces, and suppose we wanted to study like how this behaves when we move surfaces together. How would we do that? Um, so we're going to pretend that we don't know homology theory. Um, so our, our goal, given a situation like that, I call it wise of cut. Which does have a boundary now. When I move things here, I've got some submanifold S of the boundary. I move the two copies together and I get um, uh, some food. We want to relate A of Y. Okay, so the, the first small problem is that um, when I did this definition, I assumed that Y was closed. So I need to say what I mean by this. Um, and what I'll do is um, let me define um, a function. So here I have this functor of two manifolds, which is the set of all curves inside it. Um, I'm going to reuse the letter F to define a function of one manifolds, and one is a set of all, um, let's say, a configuration of points in them, but maybe I'll just say co dimension one set of manifolds. We could have said the same thing up here. Um, and then if I've got C and purely at um, the boundary of some surface, so I'm, I'm not assuming my surfaces are closed anymore. Um, and define, but maybe the way to say it is that there's a restriction map from purely F. Mathical boundary or restriction. Curly up with two manifold to curly up its boundary. Oh, so yeah, so I guess this, this would just be all properly embedded those 
But what I've really, it's, it's usually, it's one sort of always wants to have a fixed boundary condition in mind. So this, this is not a very useful thing, just defining all, all properly embedded curves in a surface of boundary. So instead, we want to consider um, really a uh, C, which is defined to be the boundary inverse of C. Do you have any restrictions like smoothness, piecewise linear, or some category of equivalence there? Probably, because we're going to be cutting and pasting things together, piecewise linear is probably the most natural category. Now, in low dimensions, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether you're doing smooth or piecewise linear or even topological. I think, in general, I mean, we'll discuss this more when we get to this, you know, try to say more formally and axiomatically what we're, what we're doing here. But, um, you know, I think certainly there are into the contact structures you, you definitely would want to have a smooth structure on our manifolds. Most of these other things, it's best just to have piecewise linear. I think an open question is to what extent these can be made for just purely topolog you know, topological morphisms. Um, so, okay, so we've defined uh, for the F, eventually I'm going to call these F is for fields, an analogy to fields in physics. Um, so these are just things which restrict a particular boundary condition, and then we can define the skin market in the laws, and let's see those, those similar combinations. So our little c is some fixed fixed boundary condition. So, so for example, so maybe let's restate our goal. We've got our cut surface, so we can put a bit a boundary condition c. Prime, we might usually want to have an equal. Um, let me, let me, we have a set of all such, so we've got this big collection of vector spaces for all possible boundary conditions we put here. And then we hope that that's enough information, or maybe we ask you what additional things we need to know to construct from that vector space here. Um, And again, just to, just to remind you where we are pedagogically is um, and we're going to prove these kind of trivial theorems that you probably know anyway about Zima homology, but then we'll see that the, the techniques that we use have much wider applicability than the same techniques and definitions that will work for all these sort of more exotic <coughs> Um Okay, so so how do we really see? So one thing that should be pretty obvious is that for all C and we give a name for this, but I do have a name. Yeah, so S is the, the manifold that we're going along. So for all C fields in S, um, we have a map, I'll call it a map from A and Y cut matching boundary conditions C in both places. Um, all this ruling along C to A and Y. And it's also pretty easy to see that if we take this and say the direct sum over all C, we can, this map becomes subjective. Why is this true? You know, if we have any any curve down here, then using 
you know, the fact that isotropic things are considered the same, we can assume it's transverse. It's transverse, we can cut along it and say it's in the end. So that's, that's pretty easy. So if we, um, so these are the, you know, we started out assuming we know, understand all these vector spaces. We've got a surjective map, one of the things we'd like to understand. So as long as, as, soon as we know what the kernel of the map is, we're done. Um, so let me give, let me give an example of some things which are clearly in the kernel, and then I'm going to claim that, that they generate all the kernel. And then I think I'll postpone the proof till we, we're going to go through all of this again a second time in you know, more general context. And maybe prove it then rather than prove it now. Um, so let's say I've got the condition C and C prime, maybe C is three points. So I'm drawing a picture of S from side here. C prime is one point, and um, E lives in the scan module for this plus side. Um, let's also assume we have some x which lies in this game model for y cut. We've got any conditions x and c prime. And I can define something I'll call, I'll use this heavy dot, meaning this sort of glue two things together. I can consider x glue to e, which lies in this game module for. Cut surface with um, the prime. So what I what I mean is I've got you know, here's a you know, close up of this area here. So I have X on the outside, and I can move E here. But I could also glue it to the other side. I'll call it e dot x. And this is in the same model for the cut surface in conditions C and C. By these things. Yeah, what's, what's e? e is um, just some uh, something on the cylinder. Oh, because you're here. Yeah. Okay. So then when you say the direct sum over C, that's like C on the mouse, not a device Yes, yeah, that, that's, that, that's a good question. So it's, you know, it's when, you know, when you're a low dimensional topologist, you sort of instinctively do everything up to isotopy. Otherwise, you would have you know, encountered many things to think about. And that's just you know, too horrifying for someone to see it. On so on this subject, you know, we're certainly when we get to manifolds of dimension n, you know, two, this example, we take things up to That was the very first thing I wrote down this equivalence relation. And when we later generalize this, one of the things we're going to require of the sort of equivalence relation to consider is that it always has this invariance under isotopic condition. If it doesn't have that, then we're not doing TQFTs, we're doing something else. Um, but on the boundaries, when we get to the dimension n minus one, we never want to do things up to isotopy. And I, I think if you look at some of the early, it, it took a while for that to sink in. I mean, there's some, there's some paper, there's papers of Vaughn Jones, which I think you know, messed up because he gets things rotate on the circle. I mean, not, not that it's incorrect results, but I just think he misstated the, the, um, So, it, and certainly, you know, thinking back, it, it, it seems like maybe a simple thing now, but you know, as the subject was developed, it only slowly dawned on people. But, and so yeah, so this direct sum is over um, you know, uncountably many you know, configurations of points on the server, not just over, say, the natural numbers. Can you go back over this? Is this in algebra, the x 
Yeah, eventually we're eventually we're gonna have a like a bi module of like writing web actions and things like that. But, but now I'm just I'm just by this notation I just mean that that's that's what we're gonna do. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and two cylinders. So this gives us um, one category, in fact, it's a linear one category, uh, morphism spaces or vectors, spaces by construction. Um, and why we care about this category? What does it have to do with these dueling theorems that we're concerning us with? Well, the, uh, so these are going to be dimensional, right? Because you have groups that go around the same. It would be, no, because I, I'm sort of at the delta equals 1. I'm taking your Jones quotient already. Yeah, but because it's a Z2 module. Oh, that's why it's So, yeah, so it turns out these will be finite. So we haven't proved that yet. Well, I mean, the statement was made about Z2. But the, the case where we don't, and you can still sort of see the, the shadow of this relation I wrote down on the board. So a more general, it's something that's very useful to consider. We still be able to see it. We'll find a new, we'll keep F the same, but we're going to find a new chromos relation. We still want to divide out by isotopy, and we still want to be able to get rid of trivial loops. And replace them with some factor of delta, which will now just be an indeterminate, and then that's it. We don't do anything else. Um, and that, in that case, you will have infinite dimensional vector spaces, but it's still sort of an interesting Okay, um, so we can that's the observation. Um, so we just define for any one manifold a, a category. I'm going to use the letter A. Notice I'm reusing the letters things like A and F that have mean different things for manifolds of different dimensions. Computer science is a manifold overloading. Um, and it's convenient because if, if there's only so many letters in the alphabet, and eventually we're going to have invariance for manifolds of dimensions 0 up to you know, n plus 1 or something. And and being here at 26. So, um, okay, what is this observation? At the one category A of boundary Y, so the Y is equal to some T manifold, one type T manifold, acts on the set of vector spaces A of Y. Where you know, C runs in the set C runs through all things. And okay, so what does it mean to have a category act on a collection of vector spaces? Another thing is saying that this this collection of vector spaces affords a representation of the category. Um, it just means that for every object in the category, we have a vector space. So do we have that? What's an object in the category? An object is these fields on the one manifold, and given a field on the one manifold, we can plug it into the boundary of Y, and then we do the construction we talked about earlier. So yes, we have a vector space for every object. Um, for every morphism of the category, we plug in the map between the vector spaces. So given something like E here, so Y is the boundary of Y. We have some morphism. Something here, and how does it act over the of the other? And it's pretty easy to associate. So another way of saying is we just have a functor from a, a representation of a linear one category is a functor from that one category into the category of um, say vector spaces and so, so that line has two A of's and they're different. Yes, that's right. This guy is a vector space. That's right. Can you put a borrow one or have or? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I mean, we could. And then when the first, I mean, in the early days of the subject, people used different letters. Maybe V for vector space and things like that. But, but the problem is we're going we're gonna to need something. Eventually, we're going to have like four manifolds, need something for four and three and two and one and zero manifolds. And 
you know, just in no case it's complicated. So, so that, how do you know which is when you use reading? How do you know which is, is it all the way? Yeah, you have to know the dimension of the thing that's... The dimension of the yeah. But yeah, that's... that's uh, I mean, I think that, that was... Uh, but I think, you know, maybe Dan Freed was the first person to start using the same letter for it. So, <laughs> blame or I should credit Dan Freed. You know, it's the to my mom. That's... And it has many innovations. Okay, so now that we've introduced, what have we done? We've introduced categories for one manifolds, and we've noticed that the, these one manifolds, you know, that one manifolds is boundary of service, we get an action of that category. Um, so now we want to give our more abstract definition. So let's. Second is we can we can draw this the following diagram. You can have a scheme manifold for the cut manifold with um, non-matching boundary conditions A and B. Here we can act, and so th this manifold Y cut, it has both a, we'll say, a right and a left action of A of S. Because we can move cylinders onto this boundary component, we can move on the other, and, and those differ by sort of flipping the cylinder. So, so maybe for all morphism in the end, let's say E from A to B. Here, D cross one and here. You can map the little on D, little on A, and this diagram can be used. So, I really just, you know, this is, this is only very slightly different from the first you know, elementary version of the group that we did. And so, the, the restatement, so this will be our co dimension one. For, um, for the two is that um, A of Y so GL is um, is universal with respect to these properties. Yeah, that one should it really use acting sort of in the opposite direction from B to A. You can bring your B to an A, so should it be like an inverse or something? Like a bar over the uh, E? Uh, the top one. The upper one. Let's go up to the upper arrow. Up one below. This one. E inverse. From you're going from B to A. Um it's like right of action versus left action. Right. So oh okay, well I just the way you went over there, it's like E goes from A to B. Okay. Um I mean I understand what you mean. Okay. 
Yeah, I, did, I, I haven't been, I wasn't very careful in you know, the exercise of the street and south, but um, it kind of, yeah, so maybe, maybe it was, okay. <laughs> One of these two. It's, not, it's possible to choose conventions for right and left and obviously categories. This makes sense. Okay, so what am I... So I'm saying that this thing, the thing we're trying to compute, the same model for the heat manifold, is the universal vector space that enjoys these properties. Universal, universal with respect to one and two above. Um, another way of saying that is um, A of Y C G O is the cohen. So in a category, opposite just means things in the other direction. And so, okay, so for those of you who haven't seen it before, what does it mean to say something here is universal? It means if I had any other vector space that enjoyed these properties, so I had um, you know, maybe some other map, HL instead of you know, H sub A to my other vector space in the And similarly, there were you know, H is in A, H sub B, and so this other diagram here commuted, then there exists a sort of unique map here so that H is in all composition. So, so why, why bother stating it in this more abstract way? Well, if you're, if you're only ever interested in vector spaces, it's quite no point. But um, these circumstances where we want these schema to be more exotic things, and maybe just want to be looking at some arbitrary distributed symmetric categories, and then so, I, again, I'm assuming that a lot of people in this room are seen stuff like this before and are quite comfortable with it. In fact, quite more comfortable with this than the first version. Um, okay, so so we've done two versions of the gluing theorem, but maybe we're not satisfied because maybe we actually want to do some explicit com computations. And, you know, if I say something, so if we want to do computations, this theorem is actually worse than you have to start with this universal thing and say, well, gee, if we take the direct sum over all these and line out by this particular subspace, the thing I wrote down in theorem one, you know, that would get us a little bit closer, but we still have a, a, an infinite direct sum. And we'd like to simplify that a little bit. We'd like to somehow skeletonize things. And we might also like to take advantage of the fact that these are semi simple categories, which we'll explain in a moment. So the, the third version of the Boolean theorem is the one that we would actually use to call the specific answers. So you're trying to untangle that sample. Are you looking for a tangible one or finite? I, I, what, I, what I'd like to do is, yeah, I'll find it. So that's, that's the last version of the movie here. Um, okay, so, and again, this is. A, Occasionally I'm skipping details, but this is we'll hit the details later in a more general context. And it's just when we talk about the general theory, we want to have something specific in mind. Um, so but maybe I'm failing that because for the most I mean, you know, I guess the point is yes, so strictly speaking, I've only been talking about curves on surface surfaces, but you know, everything I've written down here is gonna work, you know, I won't even have to change notation. And I'm so used to talking about the general thing that maybe I'm using the um, advantage of talking about a concrete example because I, I never say curves on surfaces, but I always say curly F and curly A. I don't know. So maybe. 
see the advantages of having the exam. Okay, so, so let's think about this category A of a circle. This is an actual circle. In general, this, these manifolds are actually going to be destroyed unions in many circles, but let's look at this one. Um, so we note that um, any object of A and S is isomorphic to either a circle with no points on it or a circle with one point on it. So these are any other variation of points is isomorphic. You know, it's just the parity of the points. Um, you might say, what about a circle with two points? Well, if you take this morphism from 2 to 0 show that the relations of the process is actually most um, So let's. So we can make our category a lot smaller instead of considering uncountably many A's and B's, we just have to consider two possible A's and B's. Um, so what are the Hobbes fixes? Well, it's pretty easy to see repairs of these is that um, I'm going to call this uh, uh, these things 0 and 1. Um, um, from 0 to 1, I see my to 0. So the category actually breaks into two pieces, from zero and one. Um, from zero to zero is equal. It's two dimensional. It's equal to the linear span. It's linear combinations of the empty cylinder and the cylinder with an empty cylinder. Single ring. So I'm give these names and put this in R or for wing. And this empty set. And similarly, um, from one to one is equal to the space generated by. Now we can write down some eigenvalues in terms of linear combinations of these. Um, we'll have P0 plus or minus defined to be one half of the empty set plus or minus the ring. One plus or minus one half of the plus or minus a twist. Representation is a direct sum of your uses. Um, and there's something so we know that um, any semi simple algebra is a 
direct sum of matrix algebras. Another way of saying that is the endomorphisms of the graded vector space. And similarly, the semi simple one category is isomorphic on the, on the nose to um, a, a category of graded vector spaces. And for every object, I can find a graded vector space in the endomorphisms are exactly the graded one. So we'll talk about that more later. Um, so A is semi simple, and L is a complete set of minimal bipodes. Um, Okay, so now um, I'm find some notation that's a little bit, you know, before we define A and Y with a boundary condition C, we'll see some fixed number of points. And now I want to define something similar, but it's going to be a spin module for a surface Y with some item code and stuff. So what this means is that A is going to be an item code and the category boundary line. And we just impose this as a boundary condition. So we can do this. So we sort of draw alpha here, where alpha is maybe one of these linear combinations that it's talking about. And we consider the unit map instead of all So now, version three. And this is the one you would actually use to compute. Um, let's say that a of the blue surface is naturally isomorphic to the direct sum overall alpha in our complete set of minimal line codes of the um, same on the cut surface that we impose to the matching and So here we've finally gotten to it. This is a, you know, for most, many of the categories we're interested in, this is going to be a finite direct sum, or this is a discrete direct sum. So this, historically, this came first. And if you look in, uh, I guess, quite a bit more in cyber and early papers I've written, this is, this, this is where they did it. Um, and you might ask, okay, well, if this, this came historically first, and this is most convenient for computation, why would you ever bother with these more abstract things? And of course, these work in non semi simple cases. Um, they work you know, in the categories in which they work, arbitrary things like that, whereas this is kind of specific to semi-simple linear categories, which you know, maybe the main most important examples are going to be Okay, so in the last few minutes, um, okay, so we just spent a long time talking about basically just z homology on the surface. Um, and that's, well, we did that because it's sort of a toy model that's we have one in mind. So what are some other examples one might want to think about? Um, well, we can start, we'll, keep, we'll con continue to consider just surfaces. And otherwise, still going to be the set of all dimensional and submanifolds. Y, and but we'll change the relations that we've done. So of course we want to, you know, it's sort of all the machinery breaks down if we don't have the relation that isotopic, you know, things that differ by an isotopic are, are related. 
Um, and things get pretty difficult if we don't allow ourselves to kill trivial loops. So you know, if we didn't have a way of getting rid of loops, we would have infinite dimensional vector spaces for all configurations of loops. So we certainly want to say that this is some multiple of delta of this empty picture. But what comes next is actually a lot of freedom. Um, so I, I just want to, for those of you who might want to play around with this sort of thing, some things to think about, and then maybe also give some questions about you know that. So we'll end up with some vector spaces that are, can be defined in a very elementary way for surfaces, um, but you know, proving certain things about it might be difficult, and that sort of shows some of the utility of these you know, more abstract theorems about the world. So, um, okay, so the first thing we might want to consider is um, a very slight variation of what we did before. Instead of saying that this curve is equal to that curve, we'll say it's equal up to um, negative one times that curve. So whenever we do one of these little sal wheels, we turn the curve, we pick up a factor of negative one. And that, in order for that relation to make sense, we better take this delta from the factor from over here to also be equal to negative one. Um, okay, so some exercises. Um, first one is easy. And that's a dimension of the scan module. I'll call it delta equals negative one scan module of y is again equal to just the length of z not two homology of y. Which is equal to the direction of the thing we've been talking about most of the time, which is the delta equals 1. So we get a vector space that's the same dimension as the one we talked about before. Um, another exercise is that there does not, does not exist, so these vector spaces are isomorphic, because they've got the same dimension, but there is no natural isomorphism. You might say natural with respect to what? Well, with respect to, say, homeomorphisms or with respect to blue. And then final exercise is, okay, we've got some exact, we've got some vector space. Yeah, so what is a natural asymmetry to? And the attempt is think about the spin structures. So um, we can consider we've got this map, and we have our big infinite dimensional vector space of finite C linear combinations of these curves on Y. In fact, let's just consider the disk. Kernel, so we're wondering. So we, you know, we we fixed what this is, and we want to consider different examples of these, and that's the same as considering different examples of the kernel. This is the sort of this vector space U of the disk of the thing is generated by all instances of these sort of local relations I've talked about. And so what we maybe like to do is classify all possibilities. What are all the quotients we can take that make sense? Um, so, to start, so this time, eventually we'll do that in detail. And of course, that dude, Long Jones. Let's say that B. Minimal um, boundary conditions such that you are 
Um, in the written side here, what follows that if, you know, if our boundary condition gets any smaller, we have to be in the zero space. We know that um, if we cap it off like that, where u is some linear combination in here, we get zero. And that's true no matter where we cap it off. And all possible ways of capping. If zero, um, so okay, well that's that's a finite number. So we're that's just a finite number of linear equations. So we ought to be able to solve that to come up with other examples if other examples exist. Um, so let's let's assume that B is equal to six points on the boundary circle. Um, that means if we take u is a1 times this picture, say 2 times this picture. I'm drawing, there's sort of five different ways of drawing curves modular in these two relations on this. exercise to just solve these equations with the a sub i's um, and show that you know, there's this unique solution of up to scale. Um, if you assume this, the solution is symmetric and that implies that a1, 2, A3 are the same, A4, and A5 are the same. That makes it easier. Um, yeah, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe I should just stop and do some of these things. I think that's what I'll do. Um, yeah, so, um, so, so I guess the, just to go a preview of what comes next, we want to talk about some more more exotic things. Like we want to begin to hint that here. And in some ways, these can be thought of as direct natural generalizations of Z mod two homology, but it's generalizing it not in the usual direction of, you know, say, Z mod three homology or homology with coefficients in any given group or homology with arbitrary space instead of the surfaces. These are generalizations of Z mod two homology, which only makes sense for surfaces, and they're actually um, Related to you know, interesting you know, quantum variants. Um, I, I meant to mention it earlier, but even this rather trivial looking example of Zima 2 homology, you know, there are people, solid state physicists, who have you know, made their careers in the last five years you know, writing about exactly that theory. You know, you know, a little bit more things at it, but you know, it's, if you talk to a solid state physicist, you say Zima 2 homology, it's like, common block, you say the torque code. I say, oh, yeah, that's, that's an important thing to us in quantum physics. Um, this example is closer to the solution, which I haven't written down yet, which we'll write down next time. Yeah, this is the one that people are spending millions of dollars investigating down at Station Q where I work. Um, and you know, try hoping to find things that behave like this in nature and build a quantum computer around it and things like that. So, so one of the points I wanted to make is, is you know, from some points of view, these, these examples are kind of Exotic. They weren't really discovered until like the 80s and 90s, and there's a lot of inscrutable you know, looking papers about it. But there, there's a way of talking about them that is, is really quite elementary, and one could imagine had been done in say the 30s or the 40s. Or something. Um, so anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Maybe mention the, another family of examples having to do with maps and the classifying spaces and finite groups and that kind of and at that point, we'll have enough examples and we'll see how they're all rather similar. We'll just try to formulate carefully the general theories. And so that's, so that's, questions? Do you have a reference? 
Um, there's on my web page. There's some notes. There's about hundred pages, and I'm actually following them. They're, they're a little bit out of hand. Part of my motivation for doing a series of lectures is it helps me revise the notes and then try to get them published. Uh, but, uh, um, so that, that's one thing you can look at. And I think for these beginning parts, it, you know, hopefully it's readable. Uh, there, there's a few, you know, there, there'll be some inconsistencies between what I say now and what I said five years ago. Because, um, that's okay. And you might be updating your notes. Yeah, I think it wants to probably make updates available to people. But, um, but there's, there's a version from the other So that's one thing to look at. Um, another, you know, I mean, there's, there's a whole set of literature on things like this and the sort of sub factor of women algebra things people want and students do. And from that, you're categorical on what you're supposed to find that yeah, that's more the point of view in the notes that I talked about. So if you have to. Um, and I guess the other thing, we give a little bit more of a preview. Um, here we, we started out by defining a vector space, and then we proved all these various different versions of what happens when you cut when you are two manifolds in half and how the vector space decomposes. But we also define a category for a, a one manifold, it's called a new minus one manifold. And then we might want to say, what happens when you start cutting those apart? And then you get into this sort of, you get away from this sort of rather standard algebra to sort of more and more exotic algebra. And when you start going down to even lower dimensions, I, I think it's not, you know, I don't think there's a universally accepted best way to describe this doing here to find the sort of categorifications and tensor products that we do. Um, um, Scott Morrison and I have one approach that, you know, that we like to, you know, we can talk about, but I think what I've before talking about that thing which solves it in all code dimensions, hopefully, we'll talk about just doing it one code dimension down from this, which is, is it still not that widely. So it's still open, all code dimension problems still open? Well, it's, I think it's the people, different people might have different ways of, of doing it. So there's not, you know, if you were to ask five different experts in the field and how you describe this code dimension, you might get five different answers. Um, which would be not that they're incompatible with each other, but have different points of view. Whereas I think everybody would get this, this code dimension. One of the things I'm talking about here, yeah, everyone's going to get the, more or less the same answer. 